I'm gonna assume this is writing from the hard drive and try to upload this to YouTube afterward because it doesn't seem to be exactly cooperating again. Uh, but anyway, okay, we'll go <coughs> anyway. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about probability with discrete random variables. We are not uh, explicitly talking about STEM, but nevertheless, I have to tell you that there is uh, Columbia policy that requires me to disclose potential appearance of conflict of interest due to Columbia receiving grants about Stan and me using Stan for business purposes, even though Stan is open source software that has been featured on billions. Okay, so just to review a little bit what we were talking about on Tuesday for people like Fisher, Naaman, uh, old frequentists, uh, very old at this point, uh, probability is needed to describe the consequences of explicit acts of randomization on the part of researchers. That is typically random sampling of units from a much larger population in order to make inferences about the data generating process in that population or random assignments of units uh, that you have data on to treatment or control groups in the context of experiment. Uh, you can also consider measurement error on the part of the person collecting the data uh, to be a random variable, introducing some randomization there, things along those lines. Uh, but like we said, although probability is fundamental to the frequentist way of looking at things, it's not taught in depth in introductory or intermediate classes. And you have to keep in mind that for most of the history of social science, uh, most graduates uh, from graduate school in those programs only took the one or two classes they were required to uh, take and then they go off and start doing research without really learning the foundation adequately unless they take you know the advanced kid classes um, and then they may be exposed to the foundation hear about some of the criticisms uh, but most don't and what we've seen in the last 10 years or so particularly in social psychology is a very uh, explicit example of what can go wrong when you have a lot of people who don't really understand the, the foundations of the quantitative techniques that they're using. They don't really know what a p-value is or anything like that. They just know to look whether it's less than 0 0.5, and if so, then uh, 0.05. And if so, then you, know, you send it to the journal, and the journal will publish your stuff. And, you know, what could possibly go wrong, uh, except everything went wrong with social psychology. It came to a tipping point where they realized, particularly uh, assistant professors and graduate students and postdocs, that the entire subfield might have zero reliable empirical findings. But the people who made the not reliable findings are now the ones who have tenure and are have been, you know, resistant to change. And it's just, you know, a mess. Uh, that they're working through, and part of that has been switching over to more uh, Bayesian techniques. But I think what we've seen happening in social psychology, psychology more generally, is also things that we're likely to start see happening in other subfields. More recently, supervised learning essentially denies that probability is essential for the purpose it's intended to, namely predicting the outcome variable in the testing uh, data and for the most part ignores all forms of uncertainty. Those of you who were in the class uh, last semester uh, uh, that I taught, you know, we read two of the most popular textbooks um, on these data mining techniques and not once was, you know, any uncertainty uh, talked about at all. Even though the authors of those books, they have PhDs in statistics, they know probability. There's a lot, or not, maybe not a lot, but multiple areas in which probability could be brought to bear on supervised learning in a fairly straightforward fashion if someone were to choose to do it. Uh, but the authors of those textbooks chose not to. It seemed not a big uh, priority to them uh, and to most people uh, in that field. And they really do not want probability to be a hurdle that people have to get over in order to start using uh, these techniques. All this sort of learn to code uh, mantra is really about lowering the barriers uh, to people being able to uh, engage in this form of 
uh, quantitative method. You can also see it with the fact that uh, industry, particularly tech companies in the last uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years have given tons of money to universities like Columbia and you know, other ones as well. I'm talking more than $5,000 to build you know, the Data Science Institute or the you know, Somebody Somebody Center for uh, Data Science, and that was a reaction to statistics department. There's a lot of stuff about you know, what's a data scientist, and it, is it just a synonym, a synonym for a statistician? And I, I don't think that is the case. Uh, but you hear all this talk about, oh, we're bringing people together from across disciplines, and. You know, we're going to solve the problems of tomorrow and all this stuff. But when you get kind of by, you know, past the hype and just sort of uh, look at the big dynamics going on, these companies, you know, gave universities tons of money to build these departments or centers where statisticians were the minority. And computer scientists and engineers uh, have much more of a say in that curriculum. And those industry people, you know, wanted people to learn how to code, not just you know be able to do stat statistics and theory. Learn about you know wrangling with data. Learn about databases. Learn about you know random forests much more than you learn about instrumental variables or things like that uh, that have been hallmarks of economics and social science uh, more generally. And so, as social scientists, you ought to be able to understand. When these industry principals, you know, put up a lot of money uh, to create institutions where the agents con are, you know, made up by a minority of statisticians, you ought to be able to understand the dynamics of how that is intended to play out, uh, you know, for better or for worse. But probability is not uh, really a prerequisite, at least not to get started with something like that. Whereas the Bayesian approach that we're going to talk about in this class disagrees sharply and simultaneously with both the frequentist approach uh, and the supervised uh, learning <coughs> approach and they consider probability fundamental. It is a hurdle, but it's a hurdle that we're going to try to get you over because we want to be able to describe all forms of uncertainty in terms of probability, whether that uncertainty is due to explicit acts of randomization on the part of the researcher or most likely not. And I should go back and say part of the reason why supervised learning uh, departed from frequentist statistics and probability this way is that the data sets that people are doing these supervised learning techniques on are typically not a random sample from any well-defined population. They don't have a treatment variable that is randomly assigned, you know, treatment or control or anything like that. So it's not clear where any of Fisher's stuff would really uh, play in in that supervised learning framework. But with the more sort of general uh, perspective on probability that the Bayesian approach uh, entails, we're able to use probability to describe uh, uncertainty in you know, all its forms for all the, the sources of it without requiring that to be you know, something that has random repeated trials or things like that. So uh, you know, we're going to dive into probability. I recognize it's a hurdle, and it, the first part of this class is probably the most uh, difficult, and you know, there's some people that, you know, if you can't really get over that hurdle, then you know they're going to end up dropping the class. Uh, but there's really no huge value in teaching people how to learn uh, use Stan, which is an extremely powerful approach if you don't have a foundation for what are the calculations that it is trying to facilitate for you. So we're just going to dive into the math on this. Um, so. First thing we want to define is a set. So it's a collection of elements. Those can be intervals or those can be isolated elements. Um, one set that is very commonly used, set of real numbers denoted R. Uh, real numbers are essentially the ones that have decimal points. For those of you who've uh, taken more math than I am and where like, numbers refer to complex numbers, I am never referring to complex numbers. I'm only talking about real numbers or subsets of real numbers, such as the integers, which are essentially a restriction of the real numbers and all the decimal places are zero. We can talk about the positive or the non-negative real numbers. Uh, but sets can also be categorical in addition to uh, intervals. So we could have you know, race categories, religion categories, what state do you live in uh, is constituting a set. In this session today, 
we're going to be talking about a subset of the integers, and that set is usually denoted with a z. And the reason why we start out talking about sets is because we then want to review the definition of a function. It's some rule that uniquely maps, and the uniqueness is important, but it's a mapping from uh, each element of some input set to some element of the output set. And in order for it to be a well-defined function, that mapping has to be unique. And a particular sort of function that we're going to be particularly interested in in this class is a random variable, which is a function from the so-called sample space to some subset of the real numbers. And the rule that defines that function is going to have to do with probability um, in one way or another. So here we have a function. The input set is the real numbers between 0 and 1. The output set is the positive real numbers. And the function is not given here in explicit mathematical form. But you can see it from its curve. And you can see that for every element of the input set along the horizontal axis, it maps to one uniquely value defined on the vertical axis, the output set. So this is an example of a function. Uh, but there's lots of functions. And we're going to be sort of uh, concentrating especially on the set of functions that can be considered random variables. Because the rule that defines the mapping from the sample space input set to the some subset of real numbers uh, output set uh, is going to be based on a probability uh, rule. And we'll see one of those um, in a sec. So what does the sample space mean? Uh, so the sample space is denoted typically by this Greek letter. Who knows what this Greek letter is? Oh, All right, good. One thing you need to do is learn the letters of the Greek alphabet, both the lowercase ones and the uppercase ones. I only have one Greek letter on this slide, so it's pretty easy to understand what I'm talking about. But as we get farther along, there's going to be two or three Greek letters on a slide. And if you don't know which letter is which, you are not going to be able to understand what it is that I am uh, talking about. There's a list in the uh, Moore and Siegel book. It's on Wikipedia. Uh, it's on tattoos. Like, just <laughs> learn them, all right? <laughs> Anyway, this is omega, and it's often used to denote the sample space, the set of possible outcomes of uh, observable random variables. So suppose you roll a conventional six-sided die. What would be the sample space for that process? So you roll it once. I mean, that depends on how you define it. It could be the, like the dots on the die. It could be the numbers that you as, uh, assign or associate with those dots. It could uh -huh. be the way that it flips in the air. Uh, right. So let's say uh, we're talking about the second one specifically, the number uh, for the side that's face up when you roll it. One through six. Uh, correct. The integers uh, <laughs> one through six would be the sample space for that case. Now, uh, one thing that people get confused about a lot is conflating a realization of a random variable with the function that generated it. So in the case of a die, the function is the process of rolling it. The number that comes up uh, is a realization of that random variable. So if it's 4, 4 is not a random variable. The process that yielded 4 is the random variable. And there's a convention that goes back to the days where you know statisticians were forced to write things on a typewriter. So the capital letter, such as capital X, indicates a random variable, the function, the process. Whereas its lowercase counterpart, little x, would indicate a realization of that random variable process. So little x would be like 4. Big x would be the process of rolling a die once. Uh, but that is a convention that you'll see used in a, a lot of books, and I'll use it in the notes. So uh, one example that I do every year, and I like it a lot, uh, is bowling, which historically speaking was not something that social scientists uh, studied in any great depth. Then Bob Putnam wrote that book, and everybody wanted to study bowling. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to be sort of studying the mathematical properties, not the social capital thing. but. The reason why this example is good is that bowling is uh, boring. And the reason why it's boring is it's so simple. Uh, it's not interesting enough. But simplicity is good when you're trying to learn about 
uh, probability and things like that, particularly when bowling is just barely rich enough to illustrate all the concepts of discrete probability that we want to talk about today and also next week. So each frame of bowling starts with 10 pins and you get two rolls per frame to knock down as many pins as you can. And, okay, so what would be the sample space for the number of pins you can knock down on the first roll of a frame of bowling? Zero to 10. Zero to 10. So it's gonna have 11 elements uh, to it. And someone who is much more interested in the mathematics of bowling than I am uh, wrote her dissertation uh, discussing a few probability distributions for knocking down uh, x out of n pins. And the one that we want to use is given by this uh, function here involving a ratio of so-called Fibonacci numbers. So the sequence of Fibonacci numbers is defined. The zeroth Fibonacci number is equal to 1. The, the one Fibonacci number is equal to 1. And the subsequent Fibonacci numbers are all defined as the sum of the previous two uh, Fibonacci numbers. And so we can define a function that is going to return us the probability of knocking down little x out of n pins on a roll of a frame of bowling as the xth Fibonacci number divided by uh, negative 1 plus the nth plus 2 Fibonacci number, where n is the number of pins um, available. And you should think of these uh, functions is like a vending machine. So you push in the number on the vending machine and like out comes candy. For these probability functions, x is like the number that you push in. And what comes out is the probability of knocking down little x out of n pins. And the reason why we write it like this with this vertical bar, which can be read as given. So the probability of knocking down x pins given that n pins are available to be knocked down is given by this function on the right hand side here involving ratios of Fibonacci numbers. So those of you who have not memorized all the Fibonacci numbers, it's an infinite sequence so that would take a lot of your memory. Uh, the first 13 of them uh, are here and the Fibonacci numbers have the interesting property that like the sum of the uh, first 11 is 232 whereas the uh, 13th or the 12th if you start numbering at zero, Fibonacci number is 233. So if we can subtract one uh, from the denominator, we get a valid uh, probability uh, function in the sense that all of the values are non-negative and they're going to add up uh, to one. So uh, for those of you who have R uh, open on your laptops, you can source this URL to get uh, a copy of this code. You don't have to uh, type it in uh, right as I'm talking. But the, the first function, f, is just a faster way to compute a Fibonacci number. It uses rounding rather than recursive um, addition. So that makes it uh, more suitable for the R language. And then I define my probability uh, function here. It's a function of x. It has a default value of n equal 10. And it's going to return well, if x is greater than n, it's going to return 0. You can't knock down you know, 12 out of 10 pins in one roll of a frame of bowling. But if x is less than or equal to n, it's going to compute f of x divided by the quantity negative 1 plus f uh, evaluated at n plus uh, 2. And so that's my probability function. I define omega as the sequence of integers from 0 to 10 to be my uh, sample space. And I see if I evaluate my probability function and give it my entire sample space, uh, what happens is, OK, here's the probability of knocking down, let's say, 5 out of 10 uh, pins, etc. So we have all these numbers here. They're non-negative. And the sum of them is exactly equal to 1. And so that is what defines a valid uh, probability function, something from the sample space has to happen, guaranteed, probability one. And you know all the other uh, subsequent probabilities have to be um, non-negative. So this is a valid uh, probability function and we can you know call it and things like that. Uh, so then if we wanted to simulate the first roll of a frame of bowling, we can call the sample function, 
Okay, what are we sampling from? Omega, which is the entire sample space. We want a sample of size one. And the probabilities with which we want to sample with are obtained just by evaluating our probability function at all 11 elements of our sample space. That gives us little x, the realization of this random variable defined by the process of rolling a bowling ball on the first frame of uh, first roll of a frame of bowling and seeing how many pins you knock down. So you uh, should call this last sign here, where x gets you know sample omega size of one, prob is pr omega to get your realization of your first roll of your first frame of bowl. So what we got so far? What'd you get? What what did you get? The x variable. Yes. Nine. Very good. Seven. Seven. Six. Six. Not as good, but good try. <laughs> Anybody top nine? Ten. Ten. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Now, that ten had a probability of 0.3836 of occurring. So it's not exactly an unprecedented event. But you can get the point. And this is uh, random because, you know, essentially bowlers are trying to do the same motion every time, but due to like small things that are outside of their control, like, you know, the way in which the friction on the bowling lane is, you know, it ends up being, you know, not a deterministic process by any stretch of the imagination, how many pins get knocked down. But you should think of this little x as your model for how bowling happens, and this is one realization under your model. Questions about that so far? Is everybody who's got their laptop in R able to get a little x? Okay, second roll in a frame of bowling. So let's leave aside 10. Those of you who got less than 10, how would you compute the probability of knocking down the remaining pins, all of them, on your second roll of this frame of bowling. So for those of you who got six, those of you who got seven, what's the probability of knocking down the rest of the pins on your second roll? How would you compute that? Same formula, you just subtract, uh, subtract the uh, previously uh, knocked down, a number of previously knocked down pins from uh, 10. Right. So n would be, in your case, Right, so n would be 10 minus the number of pins that you knock down on your first roll of a frame of bullet. Um, so in general, if we let capital X1 and capital X2 be the random variable for the number of pins knocked down on the first and second rolls respectively, the function for how to compute the probability of knocking down little x2 pins on your second roll is given like this in terms of math. So we have the probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll uh, given that there's 10 minus x1 pins available to be knocked down. And so that's f of x2 in the numerator and negative one plus f, uh, 10 minus x1 plus two in the denominator. Of course, it's not possible for x2 to be greater than 10 minus x1. So we have to multiply by this i function uh, out on the right, uh, which is uh, known as the indicator function. It equals one uh, if the uh, condition inside of it is true and zero if the condition inside of it is false. And so if you try to evaluate, you know, what's the probability of knocking down seven pins on your second roll, if you already knocked down five pins on your first roll, then this will return zero as it should, because that's impossible under the rules of bowling. And so this function that we've defined here is what is known as a conditional probability distribution because the rule that gives us these probabilities explicitly involves x1, 
because n is equal to 10 minus x1. So in order to compute the probability of knocking down any x2 uh, pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling, you have to know what happened on the first roll of your frame of bowling in order to evaluate 10 or n is equal to 10 minus x1 and to put that in the Fibonacci number in the denominator there. So these conditional probability distributions is what uh, Joe Blitzstein, who you know some of you uh, over the break, I was sending the link to kind of get a head start on his class, refers to as the soul of probability. And really thinking about how to use probability in your research comes up with thinking about what would be a reasonable probability distribution, a conditional probability distribution for the data generating process that I'm trying to model uh, in terms of my research. So these conditional probability distributions where the uh, probability that some random variable takes some value depends on the realization of another random variable are very fundamental uh, to what we're going to be doing this semester. So, okay, uh, what's the next step? We talked last time about uh, Aristotle or, or propositional logic involving, you know, these manipulations of true and false. And then when we wanted to talk about, you know, empirical scientific research, we wanted to generalize that uh, to like the real numbers. So in R and basically every computer language, true maps to one, false maps to zero when doing arithmetic operations. So if you multiply one true by another true, you get one. True times false is zero. False times false is zero, etc. But that's basically just limiting yourself to arithmetic operations on two numbers, zero and one, when probability is all the real numbers between zero and one. So can we generalize Aristotelian logic in a way that we can still make uh, empirical inferences and conclusions instead of purely deductive uh, inferences and conclusions based on things being absolutely true or absolutely false. And we can, uh, but we need to do the so-called general multiplication rule in order for things to go through. So the upside down uh, horseshoe is read as and. So the probability of two things happening, A and B, can be expressed as the probability that B occurs times the conditional probability that A occurs given that B occurs, or it can equivalently be expressed as the probability that A occurs times the conditional probability that B occurs given that A occurs. And this is what is known as the general multiplication rule, and it prominently involves these conditional probability functions like we talked about on the previous slide of the number of pins you knock down in the second roll given the number of pins that you knock down on the first roll. And if we multiply those together, we can get a new function that tells us the probability that both of those things uh, happen. So um, the notion of independence is very important in probability. And it follows from the general multiplication rule. But sort of loosely speaking, to get the intuition, we say that A and B are independent if A being true tells us nothing about the probability that B is true and vice versa. In more mathematical terms, we say A and B are independent if and only if the conditional probability of A given B simplifies to an expression that involves A only. So it doesn't actually involve B, or conversely, the conditional probability of B given A simplifies to an expression that only involves B. If A and B are independent and those conditionals uh, simplify uh, to more simple expressions, then the probability of A and B occurring is simply the product of A times the probab uh, probability of B. But in general, uh, that doesn't have to be the case. The general multiplication rule uh, applies whether A and B are independent or not independent. So thinking about independence, why would it be reasonable to think that uh, two roles in the same frame of bowling are not independent? Yes? The same um, person that's throwing it? Uh, true, uh, but maybe more mathematically? 
So we saw x1 explicitly appearing in the formula for the probability of knocking down x2 pins. Uh, but in general, you know, the probability of knocking down three pins, given that there are four available, is different than the probability of knocking down three pins, given that there's nine available. And so in order to compute that, I need to know x1. And thus, they are not independent. But why might it be reasonable to assume that two roles in different frames of bowling are independent of each other? Let's say the first roll in two different frames of bowling, even by the same person. It resets entirely. So like after each frame, the whole thing resets. So they don't like they're not related to each other at all. You know, they put back up 10 pins uh, every time at the start of a uh, new frame. And so you can think about reasons why, you know, somebody might get on a hot streak or something like that. But most of uh, modeling these sorts of things is about deciding where it's plausible to assume that something is independent of something else and where you really have to be taking into account the dependence. Why, why roles by two different people, why would those be independent? irrespective of what frames we're talking about. Yeah? Um, if the first person misses entirely or knocks them all at once, mm -hmm. then the, the, the probabilities associated with the second person will not change at all. Right. So they, they basically are not, it's not tennis or whatever, yeah. where one person is like returning the serve of the other yeah. one. It's basically you know, two different people going in parallel. Uh, also, the pins, like which pins get knocked down on a roll of bowling, not independent of each other, because they're arranged in a triangle. If like the first one gets knocked over, it's more likely the one behind it gets knocked over. And so you really have a spatial uh, sort of modeling problem. If you were to consider the individual pins, we're just talking about uh, the sum of the number of pins getting knocked down on one of these rolls. So using that, what would be, uh, how would we compute the probability of obtaining a so-called turkey, which is defined as three consecutive strikes? Of one strike to the third. Uh, yeah. Assumption is being made there. Well, if you if you strike and then the next frame you're back to the same. Right. Same yeah. So if frames are independent, we can compute the probability of three consecutive strikes as probability of ten, probability of ten, probability of ten, or probability of ten to the third. Uh, so then, what is the probability, or how would we compute the probability? of knocking down nine pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling and one pin on the second roll of the same frame of bowling. So probability of nine pins times the probability of one pin given the probability of nine pins on the first frame? Uh, given that nine pins were knocked down. Yeah, right, right. Not the probability of Right, the probability. Actually right. not. Right, multiply that right. uh, two things together. Right, right, right. Yeah. And you would get uh, that probability of both nine and one. So in uh, mathematics terms, just answering this question, what's the probability of knocking down x1 pins on the first roll and x2 pins on the second roll, given that you start with 10 pins available at the start of the frame? We can write that as the probability of x1 given that there's 10 pins available and multiply by the probability of x2 pins given knocked down given that n is equal to 10 minus x1. And if you just plug in the, the ratios here uh, you know, of those two, and also remember you have to multiply by this indicator function so that you don't put positive probability on something that's impossible uh, under the rules of bowling, we can get this uh, expression for the joint or the bivariate probability of knocking down x1 pins on the first roll and x2 pins on the second roll of the same frame of bowling. So those of you who have R and you've already sourced in uh, that URL, 
it also gave you uh, this chunk of code, which basically just evaluates a, a well, it sets up a matrix that's gonna be 11 by 11, uh, and uh, initializes those as zero, and then it loops over the sample space for the first roll, calculates the probability of knocking down X1 pins, and then it loops over uh, from zero to uh, 10 minus X1, and calculates uh, the probability of knocking down X2 pins, given that the number of pins available is 10 minus X1, and it multiplies it by the probability of knocking down X1 pins, and sticks it in the appropriate cell of this matrix called joint PR. <clears throat> and because I've used the general multiplication rule correctly, if I then, outside those two loops, take the sum of my matrix, the sum of these probabilities is, again, exactly one. So the probability of something happening on the first roll and something happening on the second roll, uh, <clears throat> the sum of all those probabilities is going to be exactly one. And this underscores an important point when doing probability is that your sums over the entire sample space have to sum to one. If they don't, you made a mistake. And if they do, it is very hard to make a mistake and have it come out to be exactly one. And so it's necessary and almost sufficient for to be getting one of these problems right to check whether your probabilities add up to one, and they do here. So what does this joint PR matrix look like? It looks like this <clears throat> if you render it. So we've got a lot of small numbers here, uh, but what do they tell us? So the row index is uh, corresponding to the number of pins being thought to knock down on the first roll of a frame of bowling, and the column index is the number of pins being thought to knock down on the second roll of a frame of bowling. And so what we just did here, <clears throat> the probability of knocking down nine pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling and one pin on the second roll is given by the intersection of the row index and the column index. And we can see that under our model, that has a 0.118 probability of occurring. So there's a point, a little less than 0.12 probability of uh, getting a spare where I knock down nine pins on the first roll and then make my spare on the second roll of the same frame by knocking down the remaining pin. And we can do that for any intersection of the first row, first roll, and the second roll. First roll indicated by the row index, second roll indicated by the column index. And what we saw on the previous is that I sum up all of these numbers here, uh, they're exactly equal to one. Of course, in the bottom right of a triangle, I have exact zeros. This would correspond to knocking down like eight pins on the first roll and five pins on the second. That would be this one right here, which is zero. So all of the ones that imply I'm knocking down more than 10 pins on my two rolls of a same frame of bowling get probability zero, and the ones that are actually possible get numbers between zero and one, and all the black numbers here together sum up to exactly one, because something uh, in this square has to happen on a frame of bullet. Guaranteed. Does everybody see what we're depicting here? So uh, the left corner is like zero, zero. Ah, uh, the left corner, yes. The probability of two gutter balls. And the, oh. right, right. So you miss all the pins both times. And the probability is kind of, it's very low, right? Yes. This is a good bowler. This is not <laughs> some like drunk idiot or five-year-old at a birthday party. Um, or a drunk five-year-old at a birthday party. Um, etc. So yes. Uh, we've made you know, particular assumptions that the probability is this way and we're seeing what are the implications of you know, multiplying them together and things like that. Yes? So if we had like four, uh, like I don't know what those things are called in bowling, like basically you go four times in a row, we would need like four dimensional thing to depict it? Uh, yes, you can imagine more dimensions coming out. So we're gonna focus on but we can extend it using the same rules to trivariate to, in general, multivariate 
uh, random variables that are a collection of multiple things. For example, if we were analyzing the individual pins, then we'd have this 11 dimensional thing for like pin three gets knocked down and pin six, et cetera. We're not gonna go there. We're just gonna keep it two dimensional here because I only have a two dimensional screen. But the idea still applies, multiplying by a conditional probability, okay. So uh, as we say, you know, true plus false is equal to one, false plus false is equal to zero. Um, so we don't have to just do multiplication. We can also do addition, but if we want to generalize this to probabilities interior to zero and one, uh, we have to do something a little bit different. And in order to motivate that, I want you to think about the probability that you uh, fail to get a strike on either the first frame or the second frame or both. How would we compute that probability of failing to get a strike on either of your first two or both frames of bowling. So everybody think about that for just 10 seconds here. All right. Uh, like just a doubt, is this where you um, subtract the probability of actually making the uh, strike on the first and the second frame uh, and subtract it like one minus the probability of getting the strike? Is, right. is so the it? probability of not getting a strike is equal to one minus the probability of getting a strike. That's a good first step. Mm -hmm. Now we want what's the probability that I fail to get a strike on either the first frame or the second frame or both? And I think the person behind you knows the answer. So the probability of failing all three times? So there's just two? Oh, sorry, the probability of failing both times, right? With, yes, is equal to one. Then you would multiply them together. Not multiply. Um, um, you add. All right. I was so the probability that you fail the first time, so zero pins, uh, plus the probability that you have zero pins on the second track, second whatever run, given that you had zero before, plus the probability that you have zero, no, you only have two. Yeah, probably that you had uh, zero pins both times. All right, okay, so we're not gonna require that you get two gutter balls. <laughs> it's just anything less than 10 on the first frame, and anything less, or anything less than 10 on the second frame. Or both. So what is a strike? Strike is a 10? Strike is a 10. Okay, so I don't know that. Oh, okay. okay yeah. <laughs> you got to know that. Yes. Yes. One minus the probability of getting a strike twice. So the probability of getting a strike squared, one minus that quantity. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, so it's the probability of getting less than 9, including 9 multiplied by the probability of getting uh, 10 minus the, um, the strike you get the first time, uh, the, the probability of getting less than that given the number of uh, pain you get done? Is that right? No, but we're, we have it surrounded. It's the probability of getting, well, not, not a strike on the first thing, not a strike on the second frame, minus not a strike on both because you double count it. Right. So that is getting uh, the right number. We have what's known as the general addition rule. This symbol, the U thing here, is read as or. So the probability of A or B happening is the probability of A happening plus the probability of B happening minus the probability that both happen, both A and B happen. So if A is uh, the probability that you do not get a strike uh, on a frame of bowling, so probability of A, and then probability of B would be the probability that you don't get a strike on the second frame of bowling, and then we have to subtract off the probability that you don't get a strike on the first frame and the second frame to avoid double counting. So as we can see from this, the probability of a strike is 
So the probability of not a strike is one minus that, you know, 0. Uh, 0.62 something. So the probability of not a strike on the first frame is 0. 0.62, plus the probability of not a strike on the second frame is 0. 0.62. If I add 0. 0.62 together to 0. 0.62, I get 1.24. That can't be a probability because probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. What I have to do is subtract off the probability of a not strike on both the first frame and the second frame. Those are independent, so I can just multiply them together. So it's 0.62 plus 0.62 minus 0.62 squared, whatever that is, <coughs> uh, would give me the probability uh, that I fail to get a strike on the first roll or the second uh, first frame or the second frame or both and that is what is known as the general addition rule for calculating the probability that one or another thing happens in contrast with the multiplication rule which is the probability that both a and b occur questions about that Yes. Um, so I just wanted to clarify. So the framing of this question, what is the probability to fail to get a strike on this frame or the next one, is saying not um, what's the probability you don't get a strike twice in a row. It's saying what's the probability either time you don't get a strike. And that's why you use the addition rule instead of the multiplication rule. That's correct. Sweet. So be the probability that you don't get a strike on the first frame and you don't get a strike on the second frame. How would we compute that? Just probably the A times probably the B. Yeah, 0.62 squared or whatever. All right. So if the probability that A, uh, A uh, and B happening is zero, we say that A and B are mutually exclusive or we say disjoint. It's two uh, weird uh, phrases for the same thing just means you know these things can't both happen. So the probability of knocking down five pins on the first roll and knocking down seven pins on the same roll, that's zero. They, you can't knock down five and seven on the same roll. You need two different rolls. Uh, okay. So uh, how would we then calculate the probability of knocking down, let's say, one pin on, uh, or uh, let's do it the other way around. What's the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling if I don't tell you what happens on the first roll? What's the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling irrespective of what happens on the first roll. How would we use our rules to compute that number? Depends on what our priors are. If we assume that we have no expectation of what happens, then we just for nine in the second one, then we just compute the probability of one either one or zero happening in the first one, and then we multiply it by nine in the second one. Because if more than if two or more than two are taken out in the first one, then the probability of knocking down nine in the second one is zero. So we don't have to worry about these cases. Uh, and that's it. Right. And then, so we need the probability of zero on the first roll and nine on the second, zero or one on the first roll and nine on the second. So how do we get those two things? So we do it like this. It's going to be the probability of zero on the first one times the probability of nine on the second one plus probability of 1 times probability of 8 on the second one. Right. That's the equation. Okay. So if we go back to here, 
Uh, we have two numbers for the, the thing that uh, Lucas was just referring to. This is the probability of zero on the first and nine on the second. And here we have the probability of one on the first and nine on the second. If it was two or more on the first, then the probability of nine on the second would be zero. So we've got two things here that are mutually exclusive. And so the probability of nine pins on the first uh, Role of a frame of bowling, if I don't tell you what happens on the first, is the sum of these two numbers here approximately 0.00026. Does everybody see how we arrived at that? Right? So, in general, What's a general rule for calculating the probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll if I don't tell you how many pins are knocked down on the first roll in terms of an operation on this table? Just sum the columns. Right, sum down the columns. That would give you the probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll. So since uh, the two possibilities in this case, or however many there are possibilities, um, are mutually exclusive, we can use this easy form of the general uh, addition rule where we don't have to worry about subtracting off the probability that um, mutually exclusive things happen. But we do have to add up all the, the possibilities. So we get the joint probability of knocking down x pins on the first roll and x2 pins on the second roll with a multiplication and then we sum up over all possible values of x that could have happened on the first roll and some of these might be zero but then we're just adding zero and that's okay. <clears throat> and so what we're left with is the so-called marginal probability of knocking down x2 pins uh, on the second roll. What if I sum across the rows instead of summing down the columns? What does summing across the rows tell me? Probability of roll one. Yes. Probability of knocking down roll of my frame of bowling, irrespective of what happens on the second which is just going to be that same Fibonacci ratio that we started with. So here, again, I compute the probability of x1 uh, happening on the first row. If I sum over margin 1, I take the row sums of my joint PR table, I get back exactly the same numbers. So it's telling me the probability of knocking down you know, whatever number of pins on the first row, irrespective of what happens on the second row. But if I do margin two, I sum over the columns of my joint PR table. I get the probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll, irrespective of how many pins I knock down on the first roll, without telling you how many pins I knock down on the first roll. And we see we get numbers over the same sample space, but they're different numbers. The probability of knocking down two pins on the second roll irrespective of what happens on the first, is a different number than the probability of knocking down two pins on the first roll, irrespective of the second. Probability of knocking down two pins on the first roll is very small, 0.008. <clears throat> probability of knocking down two pins on the second roll, if I don't tell you how many pins were knocked down on the first, is much bigger, it's 0.114. And I would get that from summing down the column uh, with the two index uh, in its header. So all this sums up to 0.118. Right? Uh, is everybody with me on uh, the marginal probabilities? The reason why they're called marginal probabilities is back in the old days they would take this 11 by 11 table and they would write the marginal probability of knocking down x2 pins in the margin of the table, like at the bottom. Or they would write it on the margin on that side there. Um, so that's why it's called marginal probabilities, but is distinct from joint probabilities or conditional probabilities. Understand? So the sum of the rows must be one, because that's just the probability that you know, you'll have one of those right. outcomes. So if we sum over both dimensions, it would be one. Okay. 
Other questions? So what's the relationship between marginal probabilities, conditional probabilities, and joint probabilities? To compose a joint, or in this case it's specifically a bivariate probability of two things, but this also can be extended to three or more things. To compose a bivariate probability, we multiply a marginal probability by a conditional probability. So in order to get the probability of nine pins on the first roll, and one pin on the second row of the same frame of bowling, we multiply the marginal probability of knocking down nine pins on the first row times the conditional probability of knocking down one of the remaining one pins on the second row of the same frame of bowling. That product gave us the probability of knocking down nine pins on the first row and one pin on the second roll of the same frame, and we found that that was 0 0.11 or something like that. So that's multiplying a marginal times a conditional to get a bivariate or a joint probability. We can decompose a joint, or in this case specifically a bivariate probability of two things happening, um, <clears throat> by adding the relevant joint probabilities in order to obtain a marginal probability. So if we have you know, the two possibilities for uh, the way you can knock down nine pins on the second roll, it's either zero and nine or one and nine, and then we add those together, we can decompose joint probabilities, in this case bivariate probabilities, into a marginal probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll, irrespective of what happens on the first roll. And in general, we can obtain those by summing down the columns of our bivariate probability table. Or we can sum across the rows to get the other marginal probability, the probability of knocking down x1 pins on the first roll, irrespective of what happens on the second. So we can multiply our marginal times a conditional to get a joint we can decompose a joint into margins by either summing down the columns or summing across the rows. Okay. And we can obtain a conditional probability by dividing a joint probability that two things happening, uh, of two things happening, if we divide it by the marginal probability of the thing that we want to condition on. And that can be shown very simply from the fact that the probability that A and B occurs can be written in two equivalent ways. The marginal probability of B times the conditional probability of A given B, but we can also equivalently write it as the probability of A times the conditional probability of B given A. Since both of those things are equal to the same thing, namely the probability of A and B, we can just divide by the probability of B in order to isolate this term here, and we get the probability of A given B is equal to the joint probability of A and B in the numerator divided by the marginal probability of B in the denominator, and that is going to be true provided that the marginal probability of B is greater than zero. So we can't condition on something that's impossible if that was probability zero, but provided the probability is positive, then we can obtain the probability of A given B by taking the joint probability in the numerator and dividing by the marginal probability of B in the denominator. And that's what Bayes' rule is. It follows very simply, almost trivially, from the multiplication rule, um, but it yields something that uh, seems like it'd be pretty important. The probability of A given B, we could figure that out if we had the three pieces on the right-hand side of the equation here. And as an example of that, how could we come up with an expression for the probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling, given that four pins were knocked down on the second roll of the same frame. Say you walk into a bowling alley and you overhear someone say, I knocked down x2 equal four pins on the second roll of my last frame. 
but you didn't see what happened on their first roll of the same frame of bowling by that person, how could you use these rules of probability that we've been talking about today in order to compute the probability that let's say three pins got knocked down on the first roll uh, for that person's frame of bowling, given that you heard them say they knocked down four pins on their second roll of that frame. Don't need an exact number, but how would we calculate it? You just plug in to the pin. Uh -huh. so, so we would have. Um, so we would have uh, probability that uh, wh whoever knocked down three pins uh, on the first roll uh, times the probability that that person knocked down four uh, pins on the second roll, given that he knocked down three on the first one, and divided by the um, probability that the person knocked down four pins on the second roll. Bayes rule in order to compute uh, that conditional probability there. And you might see, well, this could be a good way of dealing with situations in which we have missing data. So abstracting from bowling, let's say our value of whatever x1 is was missing for some unit of observation in our data set, but x2 was observed. Could we use Bayes rule to figure out the probability of what that missing value of x1 actually was. But just to be concrete about it, we're thinking about this in terms of bowling. So in order to depict this, if we go back, same square, same numbers, but I've now colored in black all the numbers in uh, the column labeled four, because we're conditioning that we know the person said they knocked down four pins on the second roll of their frame of bowling. Everything in blue, uh, is joint probability of stuff that could have happened, but didn't in this particular case. So they could have knocked down like five on the first and one on the second. But we know that didn't happen because they said I knocked down four pins on the second roll of my frame of volume. So we're talking about something in this column <laughs> here, but we want to get the conditional probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll given that four pins we're knocked down in a second. Here we have the joint, the bivariate probability of that happening. And then how do we go from that to the conditional probability of three pins on the first roll, given that four pins were knocked down on the second roll of that same frame? What do we need to do? On. And so how do we get that marginal? The sum. Right. So we want to take 0.01197 and divide by the sum of the numbers in black. That. Okay, everything in the upper triangle could have happened, but when we get information, we get data that four pins were knocked down on the second roll of that frame. Uh, all this stuff in blue could have happened, but didn't happen. And we know that the sum of everything in the top triangle is 1. But given that we know four pins were knocked down in the second roll, uh, the, the sum in this column is going to be you know, less than 1. So just by itself, the fourth column is not going to tell us conditional probabilities, because conditional probabilities have to add up to 1 over the possible sample space, just like any other probabilities. So somehow we have to get all this blue into the analysis or the calculation here. And the way we do that, we note that 1 minus the sum of the blue is equal to the sum of the black. And so you can say, OK, we're taking a number and dividing by 1 minus the sum of the blue. Or you can say equivalently, we're dividing by the sum of the black to get the marginal probability of knocking down four <coughs> pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling. Uh, and then we divide the joint by the marginal to get the conditional probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll, given that four pins were knocked down on the second. Anybody have questions about that? 
So in terms of the number, we would take uh, from our joint probability table with index three and index four uh, for the probability of knocking down three on the first and four on the second, divide by the sum of the probabilities of knocking down four pins on the second roll, and we get some ratio 0.0322 or whatever. That's conditional probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll given that four pins were knocked down on the second. Now, all this time that I've been uh, talking about bowling and pins being knocked down and, and all that stuff, I wasn't really talking about bowling. <laughs> what Bayesians do is generalize this to take A being beliefs about whatever you don't know and B being whatever you do know, data. Uh, but Bayes' rule continues to apply as long as the probability of B is greater than zero. And so we can read Bayes' rule as saying, the, on the left-hand side, what's the probability of the thing that we don't know given what we do know? That seems like it's a very basic uh, concept for doing science and research. Because uh, anytime you're doing like research, uh, scientific research, you're trying to figure out something that you do not currently know. Uh, but you want to use everything that you do know, namely the data that you have, in order to make that inference. And we could arrive at that number, uh, or set of numbers, by evaluating the right-hand side of Bayes' rule, taking uh, the marginal probability of what we don't know before we saw the data, multiply by the probability of observing the data, given that what we don't know takes on you know, this or that value, dividing by the marginal probability of observing these data, and we would get out the probability of what we don't know what, given what we do know. And that would seem like that would be a very useful thing. Uh, and it just involves arithmetic uh, and assumptions about you know, what these probabilities are. So what we've done so far would actually be uh, somewhat acceptable to frequentists. They accept the validity of, of Bayes' rule. After all, all we did was take the general multiplication rule. All these rules are true for both frequentists or Bayesians. It's just a matter of how you interpret them and how you apply them. So they accept that the Bayes' rule is like calculated correctly, but what they object to is using the language of probability to describe beliefs about unknown propositions because they insist that probability is a property of a process that can be only be defined in the limit. So we think of the probability of A as the number of times that S occurs in S independent randomizations divided by S. The limit of that is S goes to infinity is the number of repeated uh, trials, the number of repeated experiments, the number of repeated whatever it is you're randomizing goes to infinity, then you just calculate up the proportion of times that A occurs, and that is what defines the probability of A. But in that case, A has to be something that uh, you know, comes about from this randomization process that you're repeating over and over again. So you could observe someone bowl you know, S times and like use that to calculate the, the probability of a strike. But the Bayesians would say, well, you know, even if I haven't observed like an infinite number of, of roles or whatever, if I just have you know, beliefs about uh, what I don't know given what I do know, I can use Bayes' rule to manage those beliefs. Yes? But uh, how can we know the second part? I mean, the probability of B based on A is uh, right, so we, we don't know uh, what A is, uh, but like in the case where A was uh, what happens on the first roll and then B happen, uh, was what happens on the second roll, we can compute the conditional probability of knocking down B pins on the second roll given that A pins were knocked down on the first roll under our assumptions about that probability. So that was just like, you know, the 10 minus x1 thing being the replacement for our n. And so we can evaluate the numerator pretty easily. The denominator is more tricky to evaluate, but once we have both parts of the fraction, we can just uh, divide uh, to get that number. 
And the last, oh, so here, uh, I've got the same square, but I've now divided uh, everything by its column sum. So this is the conditional probability of knocking down x1 pins on the first roll, given that x2 pins were knocked down on the second. So we can see if 10 pins were knocked down on the second, I know you knocked down zero on the first. Probability one, guaranteed. If you tell me nine pins were knocked down on the second, I know it was either zero or one on the first roll. But the conditional probability that you knock down one pin on the first roll is 0.618. And the probability that you knock down zero on the first roll was 0 0.381. And those two numbers sum to one because I renormalized them to be conditional probabilities. Anyway, interesting thought experiment asked by John Cook, among others. What is the probability that x is a prime number where x is some huge odd uh, integer, like you know this number here? <clears throat> So how might we think about that? Well, to someone like Fisher, uh, this is not only a stupid question, it's a question that would only be asked by a stupid person. <laughs> because x is not a random variable. There's no randomization going on here. x either is prime or it's not prime. Um, so that should say prime or not prime, not odd or even. It's odd. Uh, but it, it makes no sense to say the probability that a number is prime. Like, what's the probability that 5 is a prime number? 100%. Yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it either is or it isn't. In this case, it is. Uh, but it's not a random variable. And you can only make probability statements about random variables. And random variables are created by explicit acts of randomization. And, and 5 is, is not randomized by anything. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but to a Bayesian, well, if you have this huge uh, odd integer, like that number there, uh, yeah, it's prime or not prime. Again, I messed that up. Uh, but you don't know for sure. And in fact, no one knows for sure, because this number is bigger than the largest prime number that we know of. Um, <clears throat> but you don't know whether it's prime or not, and it makes uh, sense in terms of this degree of belief interpretation of probability to say, you know, is it probably prime or not? Well, the probability that x is prime goes up every time you divide it by a prime number and you find that it doesn't divide evenly. So, you know, you could divide this by 2, but it doesn't divide evenly. So that makes it a little bit more likely that it's prime. You could divide this by 3, but it doesn't divide by 3. So that makes it a little bit more likely that it's prime. You, it doesn't divide by 5. Uh, I don't know whether it divides by 7 or whatever. But each time you divide by a little prime factor, the probability that this number is prime goes up. Uh, but you don't know. Actually, the prime number theorem gives us a way to come up with a prior probability that a number like this is prime based on the number of digits that it has. The bigger the number of it, uh, bigger the number is, the more probability that something divides by it evenly. Uh, in any case, it, it, you can, it's an expression here uh, based on the number of digits, and you get something like 4 divided by 10 to the 10th. Uh, but you could double that if you take into account that this is an odd number, not an even number. So that's you know the probability over all numbers. The probability over odd numbers would be double that. And so, yeah, the probability something is prime has nothing to do with social science. But it's an interesting way of thinking about this thing, where something you know, is what it is, but you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then it's reasonable to use the machinery of probability to express and manage your beliefs about it. And insofar as this has any application in uh, crypto, uh, cryptography or crypto analysis, it's often based on the difficulty of factoring large integers. And if you don't know, uh, you have to do something involving, well, what's the probability that this is a prime number or something like that? Anyway, that's all we have for today. Uh, no homework. Do the reading for Tuesday. Uh, I will try to get this video up on the web, and I'll put a link uh, on uh, course uh, Canvas uh, about it. If you're not signed up or you're not on the waiting list, do that like tomorrow.
because uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to get a bigger room unless the registrar thinks, officially speaking, there's more uh, people than there are chairs. Right now, the registrar thinks we have extra room because there's only like 20 some of you officially signed up. So particularly if you're QMSS, get yourself on. If you're not QMSS, put yourself on the wait list. If you can't use SSOL, get the registration adjustment form to Megan in the eighth floor of the IAB uh, office. Another 